start again. Hello, folks. Fantastic to be back again. I'm Rajiv, a managing partner at Orias Venture Partners, an early stage VC fund. 95 startups, three unicorns, almost uh, you know 300 million dollars in uh, you know in valuation at this point in time in the in the funds. Uh, welcome. Very excited to be doing this uh, you know session with Jim Carson. The finance industry doesn't usually have the red legendary origin stories that Silicon Valley companies are famous for. Uh, you know, everybody knows that Apple got its start in Steve Jobs' garage and Mark Zuckerberg launched Facebook from its dorm room at um, Harvard. Financial market geniuses build their careers in less exciting ways, perhaps doesn't make for appealing screenplays uh, like it does in the world of tech. However, Jem is an exception to that rule. He, his approach to trading is unique. He has inspired an entire movement. During the peak of the GFC, the global financial crisis, uh, Jem's book uh, was trading about 13% of all standard and poor finder index options. In a world where options volume is much more than the underlying stock volume, that fact is astounding enough in itself. Uh, Jem believes that fund flows determine market moves more than fundamentals do. And he has a very unique strategy to profit from the volatility of these flows. That sounds like rocket science. Uh, and it is, but to be honest, one doesn't need to be a rocket scientist to appreciate the science um, in rockets. And Jem promises to make it understandable for us. That I think is the exciting part about this. Jem's celebrity status has cemented in other ways. He's a citizen of the world. He was born in London, then spent a portion of his childhood in Turkey. His next stop was Texas with a brief stint in Norway. Yeah, so Jem, you're obviously a polyglot, can speak multiple languages as well. So uh, welcome to that. So he has st studied at the Rice University. I'm particularly excited about his India connection. He's married to an Indian and he has been to multiple cities in India. So, you know, welcome and namaste, Jem. <laughs> no, I, I suppose. That. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in 2003, Jem was hired at New York's Bear Wagner, a renowned Wall Street investor. He built a team that took uh, the firm deep into the world of market making. So market making is another conversation, uh, hopefully for another time with Jem. So I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to hand it over to him for about 30 to 40 minutes. Folks, you don't need to make any uh, notes or anything because we are happy to make this conversation in the slides available after this. After that, of course, we'll move to the Q&A, which is obviously the exciting part. So please type your questions on the chat at any point in time, uh, any time that you get them, of course, and we'll definitely get to them. I look forward to productive 60 minutes. So Jem, I'm over to you. Look forward. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, uh, my wife is Indian, been out there a couple times. Um, my children uh, actually love uh, love Bangra. Their nani is like they go out and stay with their nani once a, uh, once a year for about a month uh, and uh, are particularly close with her. So this is a kind of a, a, a neat opportunity for me to kind of reach out to uh, an exclusively kind of Indian audience. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, as you mentioned, um, kind of my, my roots are in the market making world. Um, no better place to learn uh, than in the, the pits of, a, of, a, of an options uh, market. And I particularly was lucky enough to start in 98, 99, right before the tech bubble. So um, got a lot of trial by fire early, kind of <clears throat> learned the importance of supply and demand more than most investors who generally start from the more fundamental cash flow side of things. Um, I've always really looked at uh, markets as, as a place where transactions happen, right? Where there are buyers and sellers. And that kind of singular um, approach has informed everything we do. Um, understanding where that supply and that demand is coming from, what's causing it ultimately <clears throat> is what's uh, critically important as we think about the world. So I'll start with that. Um, I'm going to lead into a little bit of a presentation here. I'm going to lead it off by kind of talking a little bit. And we're going to switch to, I'm going to share my screen here. But uh, I'm going to switch to kind of starting to talk about kind of the macro um, environment that we live in at this, more, this moment and how important volatility has become. Um, if you think about where we are, um, I think a lot of your audience will be very familiar with this, but uh, kind of just to drive home kind of where we are in, in a market cycle and, and from a macroeconomics perspective, you know, obviously. Sorry, for Jen, uh, are you sharing the screen? Because we are not able to see it yet. Uh, yes. Let me make sure. Uh, apologies. Uh, there you go. Let's try that again. Sorry. How about now? There we are. That... Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, we are, we're essentially, uh, you know, 42 years in to a secular decline in interest rates. Um, <clears throat> this central bank, um, 
activism uh, has played a major role. Um, you know, when we talk about supply and demand, you you have to start in the first first uh, place where where uh, supply begins, and that's from uh, central banks and and, and the Federal Reserve uh, specifically. It's driven interest rates down from from the teens and in, in the late '70s, early '80s, all the way down to uh, two percent in the long end of the curve. Um, you know, we're we're dragging along a floor at this point, hard to go much lower. Um, and in a liquidity bubble, which is what it's created, um, you know, that that has broad repercussions for the next decade. Um, if you look at all of these, uh, you know, valuation metrics, um, whether it be a kind of a, a CAPE, Schiller PE, earnings yields, uh, you know, the, the Buffett indicators of, of, of um, you know, uh, evaluations, GDP uh, versus uh, the underlying then uh, and price to sales, every metric we're at, at records. Uh, historically, if you look at other periods with these type of CAPE uh, measures, um, you know, you get 10 year decade long negative returns and that's not even in real terms, right? In real terms, it's likely to be um, way worse. Not to paint a, a doom and gloom perspective. Um, this, is, this is what history tells us, right? Um, if you look at uh, the other periods on the opposite end of the spectrum where CAPE is very low, you get very, very robust returns. This is um, quite simply the effects of long-term cash flows um, on, on the value of assets. Um, in the last 40 years, we've had a secular move, not just in rates, but to passive flows. So there has been a, a huge revolution in, um, uh, in, in financialization of, of markets so that it's very easy to invest in passive vehicles. The success of uh, you know, equities over that period has driven an easier and more kind of focused approach to investing uh, long only in the markets. These passive vehicles um, uh, have drive momentum themselves and are a serious driver of, um, of, of the continued, reflexively of the continued uh, kind of up move in, in equities <clears throat> and assets writ large. Um, if you look at a period, our last period before this 42 year period began, um, when rates um, were actually secularly uh, going up as opposed to declining, which we think we will likely get in, in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, you know, a, a mean reversion in rates, it doesn't have to be dramatic. We're not talking about kind of a move into the teens or, or anything of that line, but up from two back into a kind of a 5% on up environment. Last time we had a, a situation like that was starting in around 1968. Um, if you look at the 14 year period in nominal terms of markets, markets went nowhere. Um, they had several declines um, of a, four declines of greater than 19% during that decade and change <clears throat> and three major um, rallies. That is a perfect environment, not for passive uh, investment, but for active investment. And uh, it's important to start for the first time in 40 years to start exploring the importance of active investment, not to mention of all products uh, given that environment. As you can see to the right, not only did the market go nowhere in, um, in uh, nominal terms, but in uh, inflation adjusted terms, obviously lost uh, more than 50% of its value. So what do we do in, uh, in this environment, right? Um, how do we hedge? How do we diversify? That's the question on everybody's mind. Um, you know, that's, you know, in a liquidity bubble, um, you know, the problem is uh, alternatives are also uh, very hard to come by because that liquidity uh, that's come into the market has also depressed risk premia um, as well as, as made uh, everything like bonds to gold also um, kind of, uh, you know, have the effects of, of that liquidity bubble. Bonds themselves are, as we mentioned, at all-time lows. Uh, you know, a bond ETF like TLT is, is likely to lose 90% of its value if, if we get a mean reversion in rates. Um, so that's not no longer a diversifier, right? And I think this has been the death of the risk parity world um, and, a, and, a, and a problem um, that's facing all investors, seeing as that's generally 40 to even 50% in other countries um, part of the market. Gold itself, historically at highs. Again, um, during many recessionary periods in the last hundred years, gold has actually fallen in value and can no longer be um, trusted as, as a source of diversification. 
as I said, risk premia um, has also had similar um, you know, effects of liquidity. Uh, VIX, an index option, can tango. So what that is, is, is the liquidity premium in markets is in the 95th percentile. So longer dated um, options are significantly more expensive than shorter dated. Uh, that creates a, a loss in volatility products as, as those options move forward, a decay, not just based on continued vol, but the decay forward. Um, volatility risk premium. So the amount between um, the implied volatility, the pricing of options, and the realized volatility that they realize on is in the 85th percentile. So again, significantly higher than average. Um, that's created in most products, um, you know, a, a significant, um, again, negative decay to options, as I mentioned, the index option skew. So the downside options relative to the upside options. So the actual protection in markets is that also the 95th percentile. So very hard to hedge with volatility products <clears throat> uh, if you're going long only. Um, very hard to uh, protect against convexity in markets as well, as all of that liquidity has not only rolled into assets, but in, in any way that people can protect and uh, investors can protect against um, assets. Um, just as an illustration, given the valuations that we're at, um, an investment of $1,000, um, you know, again, even just from 2009 to the present would have lost approximately 95% of its value if you were just buying vol products and holding. Um, that's, that's an annual negative return of 28% a year. Very hard to just go buy and hold vol products as a hedge. You need to uh, understand these vol products, but that also re represents an incredible opportunity, right? There's an incredible opportunity there given the increase in flows and given these record valuations. If you have people who understand them and can understand the flows and the, and the effects that they're having on, on the, um, the world around us. So what is that volatility arbitrage opportunity? So let's, let's dive in a little bit to um, what, what that opportunity looks like. There's really two types of opportunities. One, um, there's structural um, mispricings uh, in, in the volatility market. Um, they're, they're mispricings as I call them because they represent a, a, a risk premium yield, a significant yield above valuations. As we mentioned, as you saw from those charts, um, a buy and hold strategy with those, uh, those assets is, is a significant loser, but an opportunity to monetize those and invest in other types of volatility products represents a significant and growing opportunity. So that's the first opportunity. The second one, and which I'll dive into first, the second one really involves the actual flows and the actual effects that are, are coming off of these volatility markets that are growing. And, and uh, you know, the, the underlying predictive element of, of understanding those supply and those demand, those demand factors. Um, and I'll dive into that kind of second. But the important thing is talking about market structure here, understanding the opportunities on a relative value basis in the vol space, first of all, and then second of all, the flows coming off of them and how those affect underlying markets themselves and, and directional um, strategies. So as we mentioned before, uh, you know, stock option volumes in particular have exploded volatility uh, and the demand for them has exploded. In the last uh, two years, they've gone from uh, about 40, or about three years, from 40% of um, notionally the size of, of equity volume to, uh, to more than 120%. They are now bigger and the flows are, are greater um, here domestically in the US and, and, and even in Europe at this point um, than equity vo vo volumes themselves. That's, a, that's an astounding fact, if you think about it. The fact that 99% of the traditional asset investment world is focused on equities and bonds still, when more than 50% of notional volume is coming from the derivatives and options space um, is, oh. is, you know, makes you realize how, how critical this is to not only understanding, but being involved in and invested in. Um, so the first opportunity, as I mentioned, comes from the simple fact that everybody, um, whether we uh, are, are significantly long equities or not, is, is, is long the market, right? Um, they are long the market because they have a job, because they have investors, because they own a home, because they go, you know, they go to work every day and, and get a paycheck. They're, all of our exposures to the economy and the markets is, is dramatic. That simple fact makes, makes, creates a risk premium 
um, in volatility products and particularly in SKU um, and convex products, um, which are essentially insurance to the market and, and the economy. That volatility risk premium, which I discussed, um, you know, creates well-documented over pricing risk premia in, in, in those products. That has increased dramatically with, with this liquidity bubble, as I mentioned. And, and that simple fact um, allows for dramatic mispricings in, in certain things based on, on volume and flow, um, not just in the vol space on its own, but in the vol space versus other asset classes. Uh, and that pre presents opportunities. Um, unlike most products, this is an opportunity that's improving, right? If you think, look at most opportunities, the risk premia uh, is increasing. Uh, the, the inefficiencies in these markets are increasing because they are becoming so big relative to the rest of the markets. And there simply aren't enough players that understand or can provide the liquidity uh, to take advantage of these opportunities, much less read the flows coming off of them and use those um, in strategies. So um, that represents a significant opportunity. Just to kind of give back up and give a simple um, example uh, of these risk premiums, this, this chart shows um, volatility risk premia um, in um, uh, and the overvaluation of implied volatility. Um, historically, that is a, a structural phenomenon. And there is de there are definitely years where there is risk to this, right? As we saw in 2020, um, you cannot just go sell vol and walk away. You have to know how uh, to manage it and how to uh, have relative value long in some areas, short in others, in order to help manage the risks around these strategies, much like an insurance business, right? Um, insurance is a great, great business. Um, the, the, the thing with insurance is uh, ultimately you have to have great models and be able to hedge and be diversified, right? Um, just ask Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett made his name in uh, insurance originally. That's how he originally grew his wealth. It's an incredible product. You have to understand the risk, be diversified, and also always have, uh, you know, the, the relative value opportunity um, uh, that's possible there. So over 28 years, 1990, 2018, um, uh, volatility is overpriced by an average of four and a half percent approximately um, and one ninety-seven percent of the time. Those are numbers that you don't see in other, other types of products. Um, so not only is implied volatility in the VRP, volatility risk premium overvalued skew, um, downside insurance versus upside insurance is also um, uh, incredibly overvalued. Um, that's it. not only is it overvalued, it's increasing over time. Here in the US, it is the highest in anywhere in the world. It has been since the origin of options and volatility products um, because this is the most liquid place in the world. And this is where people come to hedge um, primarily. Because of that simple fact, skew itself, um, you know, downside versus upside is not only um, the highest here, but it is increasing. Um, it has, has secularly increased as demand for these products has increased. Um, that, that is because of, like I mentioned, inherent supply and demand imbalance. You have a long only world of more than $25 trillion in, just in the US alone, 80 trillion globally. Um, and the liquidity of the S&P 500 options is just simply not enough to provide insurance um, at value um, for that type of um, demand. Um, the demand, as I mentioned, for insurance is increasing. And because of that, products such as the VIX and ETNs and all kinds of other products have been created um, to provide hedges um, in those markets. And those are also secularly increasing demand and not just broadly, but in specific areas. And I think that's an important point that ultimately um, there is a lot of inefficiency, even just in the vol market itself, not just in the vol market versus the rest of the market. But even in the market itself, there's demand for certain areas of the curve, certain um, types of hedges that create relative value opportunities. So let's say we're looking at a relative value opportunity, right? Not just the flows, which we'll talk about later, but relative opportunities and, and taking advantage of what's high, what's low, structuring portfolios that take advantage of those types of mispricings. Um, if you're able to do that, volatility arm strategies, um, and of which we have, you know, we have several strategies, but one is is our relative value vol neutral arm strategy. Strategies like that are completely non-correlated, right? You're talking about a relative value of what's high versus what's low in vol arm markets that's increasing. These ha do not have correlation to underlying asset markets if done on a vol vol neutral basis. 
um, and actually represent a completely non-correlated stream of income um, in, a, in a way to diversify. There are also ways to take this edge and the alpha that's generated off of these non-correlated markets and structure long volatility, negative beta hedges as well. We have a product that does that as well. Um, the point here is you can create edge off of these um, relative value opportunities that can then be used to fund long volatility, um, co convex hedges, negative beta exposure, or uh, create it, use it to create yield um, and really use it as, as an income stream for investment. Um, the second source of, of opportunity here in these markets, as I mentioned, is not just relative value, what's high, what's low, but as I learned as a market maker, these relative value opportunities do produce um, income and, and do produce yield, um, but often not nearly as much as you might think because a lot of the edge flows into the more liquid market, which is the underlying asset itself or the volatility of those products broadly in terms of uh, compressing volatility or increasing volatility during times. Um, that simple fact, uh, that, that uh, necessity is the mother of invention, being in that role and seeing those effects and having to hedge against them led us to the realization that, that, that these hedges that are flowing into the underlying markets and the volatility of the products themselves are ultimately predictive. You can ultimately measure them and look at the supply and demand that they create and use these as predictive indicators and as, uh, as part uh, of, of, a, of a market timing kind of approach to, to markets. Particularly, as I mentioned, in a time where passive investment is really at risk and active management is a, is, is a much more desirable type of strategy going forward for the next decade, this edge is a significant and important um, thing to be looking at and watching and understanding in any models if you're an investor. Um, so I'm going to dive in and walk into the, to that opportunity a little bit and discuss that. Um, so what is dealer positioning? How, what is, how do we measure these flows and, and what are we talking about when we talk about the predictive value um, of, of options positioning broadly and, and, and quantitative model uh, pr prediction writ large? If you think about insurance markets, um, if we were to talk about, uh, let's say, hurricane or tornado insurance, right? Um, these, these insurance products are not at all, uh, do not have a role ultimately in the outcome um, of, uh, of whether or not there is, a, there is a hurricane, right? If a hurricane comes through, you get paid out. If it doesn't, uh, your insurance has no effect on whether that hurricane comes through town or not. Unlike that, insurance and in, in, in underlying assets um, does have a significant effect. Um, in the S&P 500, for example, um, there is significant buying of, of downside options. Dealers who take the other side of that have to hedge that risk. The hedging of that risk by dealers ultimately has a reflexive effect on what the outcomes will be. If people, if, if participants are particularly hedged um, and have long uh, put exposure, um, the dealers are short that put exposure and are hedged short deltas and long other volatility products against it. As those hedges roll off, right? Um, those dealers have to buy back their stock and sell out more of all. So that reflexive positioning of those that are hedging the dealers on the street that absorb liquidity ultimately has a significant feedback loop into the system. And those, that structural fact um, means understanding the positioning in markets is critically important for outcomes. Even going back to 1987, it's well documented that the 1987 crash was in a big in a major way affected and created by portfolio insurance um, and reflexively create, you know, massively increase the volatility that we saw during the 1987 crash. It is less talked about here um, during the, the Feb March 2020 COVID meltdown that we saw, but it's important to note that that meltdown started the day after monthly options and vol expiration and ended on the quarterly, exactly on the day of March quarterly expiration of options and vol. That is not a coincidence. March quarterly expiration had a ton of open interest, a ton of poor positioning on the, on the tail, um, which, which exacerbated the decline. And ultimately when it stopped, uh, helped reverse that decline and fed a lot of the 
uh, the flows um, that we talk about uh, back into the market to, to create this V type recovery that we've seen. It is not the only thing, but it definitely exacerbates as a major, major driver of these declines and understanding them is, is critical. Another example of, of this type of uh, reflexive uh, effects is 2017. So 2017 to, to a lot of people is memorable and, and how unmemorable it is, how, how little happened. Um, but for, from a vol perspective, it actually was an incredible opportunity and really driven by these reflexive flows I talked about. They are, it was the single-handedly most important thing to market structure and market activity in the year 2017. Um, volatility was the lowest it has been in 225 years of market history. Um, that could be coincidence, but oddly, uh, it was also the lowest uh, in, uh, in correlations in history, by, and not by a small amount. Volatility, realized volatility was 30% lower than any other time in, in 225 years of history. Realized correlation, so the underlying correlation of the assets of these index, indexes was also the lowest by 20% of 225 years of history. So why is that? What caused that? Well, there was massive, bigger than ever, significant uptick in volatility selling um, for yield and volatility risk premiums compress. Assets uh, for those entities that were selling vol in the markets notionally doubled and tripled in 16 into 17, which created vol supply. So all the dealers were stuck long volatility, right? That volatility ultimately, to, in order to monetize it or to not lose money on it, they have to hedge their books. Uh, when, the, when the market went up, that meant selling markets. When the market went down, that meant buying markets, right? And the oversupply led to even more selling because there was such losses in the volatility space if you were long it that everybody, there was a fire sale to essentially sell that vol. Ultimately, that, was, that selling was done on the index level, on a, on a, on a uh, macro level. That's where most of the selling of volatility happens. Single less op options uh, and vol were much less compressed and ultimately the idiosyncratic risk still existed. If a stock uh, came up with a, a new technology or a new cure for a disease, ultimately that stock still moved. If a company went bankrupt, that stock ultimately also moved. But ultimately if the constituents of an index have to move uh, based on idiosyncratic risk, and the index is pinned based on these flows, you are going to reflexively get moves of the other assets of the index by definition in an opposite direction, hence driving the lowest correlations in history as well. So I think that's our, our general proof and a way to kind of understand how important these vol flows were and how, how, how much they drive uh, flows enough so that 2017 again was so unique in 225 years of history. Um, Another example here, just to kind of, we talked about the Feb to March 2020 example, right? Where volatility uh, on the skew uh, side was very over, uh, was very undersupplied and exacerbated the decline because of the need for people to cover hedges. We saw a very, very similar thing play out in the election just um, last year here in the United States. Um, there was a ton of, of buying of protection this almost reflexively the, it worked the opposite way as the Feb to March 2020. There was a ton of hedging because people were very scared about what a Trump election might mean globally here in the U.S. particularly. Um, that led a, a dramatic, uh, you know, three sigma increase in skew involved for that event. That event um, ultimately created a massive backwardation. So the front of the curve for that event was significantly higher than everything behind it. Volatility at large was much higher and skew was much higher. Because of that, dealers um, who are ultimately hedging this had the opportunity to go buy volatility behind the event, right? Not specifically for the event, but on a major credit to sell short dated skew and vol. Ultimately, as that event transpired, regardless of the outcome, what that meant was that that volatility and that skew and those positions were, uh, were set to decline. And when that happened, ultimately, as that overvaluation for that, that day and that event, regardless of the outcome, came out and the, and the worst case environment did not come to pass, even though the, the macro event was 
was the worst thing as imagined by those, um, you know, a, a mixed result, potential uh, contesting of the election, um, you know, people in the street kind of rioting, right? All that stuff actually came to pass. The expectations um, were so high for the risk that ultimately, as that didn't happen, uh, it unwound all of these um, th these vol effects. That ultimately meant that dealers were getting longer and longer vol. That ultimately meant they were getting shorter and shorter delta. And ultimately, those effects, which we call VOMA, and I won't get into all of the, the, the second order Greeks, but VOMA and VEDA and VANA and CHARM, these second order Greek effects ultimately led to massive buying flows, massive vol selling flows, which ultimately led to the the almost instantaneous kind of rocket ship up. We've seen this for a lot of other events as well. Um, the, the Brexit, right? The worst case happened for Brexit, but again, that hedging, those hedging flows ultimately led to kind of a counterintuitive move on a macro perspective from a, from a flows, ball flows perspective makes 100% sense um, that th this is how these effects came out. Also the 2016 election, um, and, and the Trump election there, same thing. Worst case environment in terms of perception, ultimately reflexively the opposite outcome and in a major way because of these flows. So much like our other uh, slide for those relative value vol opportunities, uh, we have something, uh, a strategy that looks at these flows, measures them, tries to, uh, to use them for prediction, both for market direction and vol. Uh, we've been running, running that um, with historic returns for the last year and a half very non-correlated to market returns, great predictive value. Um, that as well as a great uh, opportunity, particularly, like I said, in active uh, managed circles, right? Which I think is a growing opportunity. And I'm happy to kind of discuss my macro view as well, but that represents an incredible opportunity for the next decade relative, not only because of the opportunity for mean reversion and where valuations are, but because there's a likely uh, increase of, of, of rates going forward. So that's all I have uh, for the presentation. Um, again, happy to talk about um, kind of my macro views, broadly discuss these vol flows and, and, and the reflexive uh, effects, um, but I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that, Rajiv. Thank you so much, um, Anna Jem. I think it is, it's a fascinating conversation. Lots of numbers to take in. Uh, clearly, rocket science, uh, you know, philosophies have sort of thrown out. Let me, let me sort of try and take a shot. I, I'm not a rocket scientist, so please forgive me if I, you know, get the smaller pieces wrong or the bigger pieces wrong and correct me if I can. So the first one, I think if I look at the first opportunity, what I understood out of that was, look, you know, if you want to create a steady yield, which is not linked to the market going up or down, then the way you do that is basically you capitalize on the fact that these walls have skews, either it's backwardation or contango, whatever it is, you're able to sort of take that benefit of this month's wall being, being more expensive or cheaper or whatever else as compared to the next month's wall and you arbitrage both of them. So you're able to sort of get a neutrality in terms of wall terms and you're able to make the yield coming out of that. Is that the broad understanding? Does that make sense? Probably I'd agree with that. Basically there's risk premia in the market, right? And being able to monetize that risk premia while managing the risks appropriately um, against it represents an incredible opportunity it has for a significant period of time for many decades and it is an increasing opportunity that is non-correlated to other assets. Fantastic. That was also very interesting because generally options in future markets are seen as the way to get further leverage, right? So, you know, historically the rest of the world looks at it and says, hey, you know, I want a future there because I can get 500 shares at the same time as compared to having one or two or whatever that I would have had, had I had $100 in my kit, right? And obviously you're doing exact reverse of that. You're actually using it for what it was intended to be used, which is basically to hedge, right? So, which is essentially what you're saying, you know, is, is interesting. So that first principle approach is, you know, very, very valuable. The question here, though, is, is it something that requires a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, calculations, a lot of metrics, a lot of modeling, a lot of algorithmic inputs, or, you know, is this something that you can also implement at a, I mean, you know, basic level, I look at this, uh, this month's, you know, put, uh, put call ratios, I look at the next month's put call ratios, and then I try and create something, can I do something like that? Or does this require a lot more? You know, what does a typical average investor that cannot, uh, you know, you know, sort of put a million dollars into GEMS fund, uh, you know, do? So there is, um, just like anything, there is, there's a sliding scale, right? Um, you can always do things on a lesser level with some basic understanding. Um, you know, the risk is making sure you understand what you're doing and that you're not overstepping kind of what you're doing. The more knowledge you have, the more opportunities are open to you, the more uh, you can use risk management, your understanding of it to kind of 
leverage opportunities. Um, that said, you know, as you mentioned, some basic things, skew is overvalued. Uh, contango, so, uh, you know, term structure um, is, is overvalued historically. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a risk premia to these things. The key there is risk, right? So you, you need to understand the risk you're taking and make sure you're hedging those risks appropriately um, so that you don't end up in that, that you know, that one situation like mid-Feb to mid-March where you don't have the right positioning and leverage can be significant. So understanding kind of leverage, understanding um, uh, kind of risk models broadly and how to, how to shock your models and understand how things can be related or non, you know, non-related is, is critical, but, but yes, there, there, there are definite opportunities under having a broad understanding of the vol space and the opportunities broadly that are there can inform, um, some basic approaches that can help, um, improve returns. Obviously having a, an expert on your side, helping you kind of monetize it is, is also uh, an opportunity. Excellent. I think a great, great answer. So I, I just wanted to get into the second opportunity and I wanted to sort of correlate that to the meme stocks and the entire rise of the Robin Hood world, right? We know, you know, that's something that's happening. Uh, this entire storyline around auto flow and, um, you know, Citadel and other guys sort of, you know, you know, sort of capitalizing off that, right? So uh, if I understand right, so for every new option of future that's placed, the, the market maker behind it has to hedge it. That's essentially, uh, you know, where that hedging uh, strategy comes from. The more there is flow, the more there is hedging and because of both of these there's a double square effect which means that your options uh, skews sort of change quite wildly is that the broad opportunity that we are seeing can you sort of help explain that and help us understand how robin hood has actually changed it differently if, if you know where i'm going yeah you have you have a so you've always had a very di diverse varied uh, number of participants but um the concentration was was for a long time and particularly on indexes um, on this downside kind of skew, right? People using it more of a, as a hedge or maybe long-term calls, right? For stock replacement, et cetera. Um, with, the, with the advent of, uh, of uh, you know, increase of, of retail investment um, through uh, things like Robinhood, uh, you have a completely different type of uh, investor and, 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 and increasing, right? Um, an increasing flow from that side that creates other opportunities. So, and I'll give you an example here to kind of paint a picture. Those are mostly short-term calls um, and they're more mo momentum kind of driven trades because those are primarily focused away from the indexes, much more in single name tech names, much more kind of momentum driven names. You have massive demand in uh, calls for those, those products and skew is actually quite, lower in those products but then you go look at the index level and the absolute opposite is true right this creates a dynamic for both relative value um opportunity right without getting kind of explicitly into exactly the types of structures but that represents a big opportunity there it also represents an opportunity to play timing based on where that positioning is on these other flows that i was talking about and playing now rotation not just directionally long or shorten an asset, but on a relative value, being able to say, you know what, now's a good time to kind of be short kind of uh, those tech names because the decay that's coming off of those dealers are going to have to, to sell. It also represents an opportunity for these gamma effects that we've heard so much about, right? That once the, the supply is such so big relative and then the whole street is short, added to short interest and other things that, that represent reflexive flows mm -hmm. if things start going, it can really exacerbate momentum. And what that does is essentially draws a different distribution for the outcomes of that asset based on that positioning. And I think that's the important approach. Most people, the thing about options, is most people think about the world in terms of should I be long or should I be short, right? The reality is these options positionings really affect your distribution of outcomes, really affects the, it, in, in cases, makes the tail fatter in certain situations, makes distributions what we call leptokurtotic, much wider wings um, in certain situations, and also yet much thinner kind of outcomes um, potentially at the money. And so those facts and that understanding is, is, is what's so ha uh, important. And, and that retail positioning has changed some of those dynamics significantly in the last several years. Great. I think that was a great answer. Thank you so much, uh, Jim, for that. So one question that is being asked right now is, is the backwardation in the uh, commodity markets right now? Right. So is that reflecting wrong dealer positioning rather than fundamentals? Uh, yeah. This sort of leads into the macro view as well, right? So I'm sure yeah, so, that uh, yeah. 
Yeah, hundred percent. So uh, on the from the commodity perspective, um, you know, clearly that positioning has major effects, right? Um, that that tends to be, uh, like I said before, when you have a backwardation, that tends to be supportive of assets. So if anything, that's a, a tailwind for commodities going forward. Um, uh, you know, usually that backwardation doesn't last uh, very long uh, in most markets. Uh, because not just because supply will meet demand and ultimately readjust, but um, but ultimately it also is because reflexively uh, that that support should reflexively bring the whole curve um, kind of kind of higher uh, because of that type of positioning. So from a from a vol perspective and a market perspective, those that positioning has significant feedback loops, which makes certain outcomes more likely. Um, but from a macro perspective, the argument, as we all kind of know, is that these are this is primarily driven on supply and demand effects because of the breakdown uh, of trade, right? Uh, globally, um, uh, you know, a lot of the commodity kind of movement is this, people are expecting that this will uh, decline. We've also had such a rally that people expect some type of mean reversion. My broad view, and this is where I can kind of dive into kind of some of my macro views, is that um, that we're actually likely uh, to get a, you know, because of all the fiscal spending on the back of not just COVID, but because of the inequality we've seen globally, um, there's a demand for more money to the middle classes, right? Um, we've had 40 years of a, a significant increase in inequality, not just here domestically, but globally. That's been primarily, in our view, driven by supply side economics, which has been really the, the push for 40 years started with Reagan here in the US, the flattening of tax rates, right? Also was followed up by dramatically uh, increasing of monetary policy. Monetary policy is supply side economics, essentially. You're essentially giving money to people who can borrow it, right? Or assets or people who own assets. Ultimately, who borrows money, wealthy and corporations. Ultimately, uh, you know, QE affects assets. Who affects for the benefit of assets going up again? Wealthy and corporations themselves. Ultimately, that drives uh, that money gets put into corporations one way or another. That drives innovation. That drives a much you know like much like you've uh, probably benefited from Rajiv uh, rights investment into um, venture venture capital um, and 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 companies that are looking at 20, 30, 40 years four year four year returns. They have the benefit of not worrying about cash flow for the next five years, right? That ultimately drives innovation, but it also drives deflation, not inflation. Ironically, all that money coming into markets is not producing, and people thought it would produce inflation. It's creating deflation, which then creates a circle, right? Then it creates more monetary policy, more ultimately inequality. And we've got we've had this for 40 years. That's why we've seen the move in, in growth that we've seen over these years. That's why we've seen the, the boom in venture capital, right? Um, uh, you know, so, you know, ultimately this is something to be cautious of, right? These cycles don't go on forever. They can until there's a political repercussion. And the question now is, have we hit a point where inequality, it, it, people are demanding, um, you know, a bit of a change to how that's worked and how that's going to continue to work going forward? I would argue that we likely are. It's entered the zeitgeist, doesn't happen overnight. It's entered the zeitgeist broadly that, that inequality needs to be dealt with. And we've had in the US $7 trillion in fiscal policy and it's been accelerated by, by COVID, right? People lose sight of how much money that is. $7 trillion is seven times the size of the re fiscal response to uh, the 2007 to 2009 crisis, seven times the, the great financial crisis. In real terms, adjusted for inflation, it's also eight times the size of the New Deal in the 1920s, right? So this is a massive fiscal stimulus. It hasn't all been spent. It's just getting started to be spent. So as we recover from COVID, expect that spending to be a dramatic effect on inflation. This is real inflation because you're giving money to people now as opposed to corporations. Giving money to people, people spend money. Right, people ultimately um, are going to use that to buy goods, and we're seeing that inflation now. The Fed is saying it's transitory. I'm incredibly skeptical. Yes, are there supply side effects that are short term having an effect? Yes, but I think there are decade long, you know, fiscal 
stimulus um, you know, reactions that are likely to lead to higher interest rates in the long end of the curve. And going back to my presentation from earlier, I think we all know what those knock-on effects of something like that would be. Um, so, you know, again, from a macro perspective, I think I think that is something to, to keep in mind. And that backwardation, um, in my mind, would be something uh, to kind of fade um, if, if you believe in kind of that broad um, thesis. So regime change, you know, uh, 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 the logical next question, perhaps in my mind that occurs to me uh, is, uh, you know, Jim, what does this mean to correlations between assets, right? So historically, we've always had the 60, 40, 70, 30 bond versus, uh, you know, uh, equity, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, how does the entire storyline change once this, uh, once this flip happens, as it were? We are, we are at record valuations. I think everybody knows that. Um, that's, uh, you know, that's not new news. Uh, the reality is that people are trying to hedge and people are trying to diversify. But much like I showed in the slides earlier, that means those things are also overvalued. Bonds is a great example, right? Um, the most basic example. That ultimately means we're in a everything bubble. It is a liquidity bubble. There is more money chasing too few assets and too few ways to hedge. Um, so as you might imagine, if that's the case, into a decline, that means things are, things are gonna be much more correlated uh, and there's much, it's much harder to find that true diversification. So how do you find that? What do you do? I mean, that's the follow-up question, right? And, and ultimately it, it comes down to what used to work. Go back more than 40 years ago, what used to work? not just putting your money in passive investments and closing your eyes and, and, and looking at 20% type returns per year. Um, it's active management. It's finding opportunities, you know, finding um, relative value um, opportunities. There will be, in my opinion, also eventually here over the next decade, a move back to kind of value type investments, investments that actually create yield, like cash yield, right? when there is less liquidity, which is what we're likely to get to if interest rates go higher, you get multiple asset con you know, contraction, but value of cash flows become way more important. And so if you have an asset that actually produce produces cash flows, they can now buy assets at a reduced value. When you start getting creative destruction, they can buy those assets. So look for opportunities in places where you feel there's quality and there's ca true cash flows and they're not at risk of, of being tied to uh, not enough liquidity um, over the next course of several years. So it represents opportunities. Um, look, a regime change is actually a massive opportunity because people are playing the same game for the last 40 years. Don't sit and go in your bunker and say, oh no, what am I gonna do? I have to have my money in cash. Go find investors who know how to create yield, how to take advantage of relative value opportunities. As I showed in that graph from 68 to 82, yes, markets went nowhere. Real assets declined dramatically. It's an awful time to be a long-only investor. But if you were an active investor with the right tools to kind of manage that type of opportunity, immense opportunity, right? Um, and so, I, you know, I would say, uh, you know, need to take a more open mind, stop looking at the last 40 years as, as the only kind of game in town and look at what other opportunities are out there. Okay, uh, the short of code for that has come to Jem, I think. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or somebody else, I mean, I, you know, I don't, this isn't a sales pitch. It's just uh, the know, reality. Uh, and, and again, I'm talking my book. I, I wouldn't do what I do if I didn't believe in it. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Right? No, I, so, I, I meant that absolutely as a compliment. Yeah, yeah, uh, another like, question that um, I think you uh, generally your your trading strategy is, uh, we got a couple of questions on your Twitter and you know decoding the code, uh, Jim, we'll come to that in a bit. But you know, I think uh, uh, in terms of the strategies you play, right? You know, they tend to be, you know, two, three months uh, short term, right? The question that I've had from Jeevan is how liquid is a long term wall market, you know, uh, available availability of warrants, you know, and what products are available for, uh, you know, short asset positioning, for instance, uh, would you be able to sort of- Yeah, yeah. there's that? a reason we, we, we focus on the first three months of the curve. That's where the majority of the liquidity is, not just liquidity, that's the majority of the relative value opportunity because that's where all the flows are. So it informs flows better because there's also short timing and you understand the windows. It also informs relative value opportunities because of the mis mispricing. Um, that said, uh, you know, there's opportunity across the board. And if anything, long volatility, long, sorry, longer end of the curve um, is, is less liquid. 
so that mispricing can be even greater, it also represents a lot more risk. And it's hard to um, manage some of those risks. Um, there's a reason you probably you guys have probably heard of long-term capital, right? There, it's a reason long-term capital had systemic uh, effects because ultimately liquidity is so much less in the long term in the uh, long end of the curve. They were making trades on a theoretical basis, assuming that those th that theory would hold. And that theory was actually correct, but it was incorrect in the sense that the liquidity wasn't there and they, they couldn't hold that type of positioning over those periods of time. So doing these types of trades and the long end of the curve where there's not liquidity, um, where ultimately assets are a function of um, you know, supply and demand. And the, to the extent you're not near an expiration and there's no actual uh, final value that these things are declining to, those things can price at whatever supply and demand drives them to. So yes, there are opportunities, but those opportunities um, are, if anything, and this is why you have Contango. This is why there is uh, liquidity premium, right? In, in these curves too, because of that lack of liquidity on, on the long end of the curve. So yes, there are opportunities, um, but but on a relative value, much more dangerous, much more um, kind of uh, set it and forget it, and and uh, you know to play those those trends with a smaller portion of your book, um, where you're not uh, where you're not as actively managing it would be my advice with with those types of opportunities. Fantastic. Uh, one quick question: You mentioned passive as a dominant means of investing that has happened in the U.S. Obviously, passive tends to drive the large to larger, and the you know, and if you're left behind, then <laughs> too bad, right? No, it right. also drives dives completely to zero, right? So you know, uh, the fact is that you know trends will keep going up and up as long as flows are in, and the moment flows are going out, then everything starts to crash again, right? That's so what right. does two questions really? You know, what does that do to the you know uh, the volatility market as it were, and what does that do to strategy such as yours? Does that make it better for you um, because passive gets more or does it make it i mean are more opportunities available in the market for you or is it is it easier that's yeah so yeah no it's a great question so it reinforces um momentum in both directions as you mentioned um the more things go up the more they have to buy of them the more people invest in them because the returns have been good which creates more right and it's so targeted on 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 several types of passive investment that it really focuses and creates inefficiencies, mispricings really between relative uh, valuations of, of assets. Um, that represents an opportunity, right? Um, understanding those flows, understanding again, going back to my model, looking at probability and distributions of outcomes relative to just up or down, right, is critical. It's it's changed the distribution, much like these vol flows have, are changing the distribution, much like, um, uh, you know, all of this leverage ultimately, which is what that is. This is all leverage in the system and very structured types of products ultimately reduces volatility locally because people are selling volatility products or they're reducing the risk premium, um, you know, on, on, on certain things to collect yield, um, increasing the, but they're increasing the tail, right? Every, the thing that the reinsurance, everything is correlated to one on the tail now. And ultimately it creates really, thick tails and it's so not a surprise that we saw feb to march you know decline like it did as quickly as it did it wasn't just covid it's the fact that these markets broadly have, have be, there's so much leverage in them that you get low volatility like we saw in 17 low occurrences of things until they break and once they break they break big and they break faster um, that is a structural component of of the world we live in now and and investors need to think about that uh, when they're investing much more than just playing the game like everybody's played for the last kind of 40 years. Great point. Uh, yeah. One further question, Jim. Uh, generally, a lot of these strategies are also predicated on how big they can get, you know, in terms of how much of flows they can absorb as well, right? So uh, you were at one point in time, you know, as you said, 13% of all of S&P's, uh, you know, options in the GFC kind of a thing. So does that mean that a strategy such as yours actually can absorb a lot of flows? I mean, does that mean that basically more and more people can benefit from it? Uh, how, how limited is this storyline in terms of you know, how many does, is this your a well kept secret as long as, you know, as long because it's making money or once it becomes a mass secret, does it continue to make money? So uh, the flows are increasing, the edge is increasing, the supply and demand imbalance between the broad market, as I mentioned, and the vol market, the people who absorb the liquidity is dramatic, right? Um, and so that in 
that creates greater and greater opportunity. That said, the option space itself, because the liquidity is relatively low, um, you know, relative to the whole market within the that market itself, there's less liquidity to to to, to position in the in those markets. You become quicker, a bigger part of that market uh, than than you know than other markets you might right. And so what that what that means is, and, and I want to be clear, I, I talked about two different strategies. We have multiple types of uh, strategies and approaches, right? Two in particular, one, the relative value opportunity in options market. That actually is capacity constrained to some extent. You don't want to be, um, you know, putting on single type of positions uh, and be greater than a certain uh, amount. Otherwise, you're going to have a feedback loop yourself in those markets. Um, our strategies, uh, our vol arb strategies, really scale uh, to, to between 500 million to billion dollars. Um, we're not talking about in specific strategies. Now, there you can do various other types of strategies. That said, because the edge is increasing and these flows are increasing, those flows are feeding back, those relative values are feeding back into the underlying assets and other products um, to, to help hedge some of that liquidity, right? And those flows, which I talked about at the back end of that presentation, are representing a greater and greater opportunity. And I think we all know the S&P, the NASDAQ, these are ultimately investing in a timing and a predictive way. And those strategies ultimately scalable to many, many billions, if not you know, tens of billions of dollars. And, and so, yeah, so the point is, it depends how you're approaching. It depends what products you're trading in to the extent you can take that signal and that edge and that inefficiency that's being driven and go use it um, in the underlying assets, which is what we are doing with our newest products. That's incredibly scalable. The vol products are a little bit less so, but still represent a significant opportunity for investors. So the reflexivity of the market itself is causing more opportunity to emerge. I think that's that's, that's amazing. Exactly right. you know, great, great yeah. point. Uh, uh, so now we come to the you know last couple of questions. Perhaps you know uh, your code on Twitter. You know, Jim, you need to sort of help <laughs> us understand how to decode this code. I got to make people work for it. You can't just <laughs> can't just give you all the answers. You got to work for it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that it? Oh, disappointment! No, 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 no. I, I, I'm happy to give you, happy to give you some, some, uh, some background there. Yeah, specific questions. Yeah, I, I, maybe be more a bit more specific. But yes, I use a lot of uh, emojis and gifts, partially to entertain myself because I'm out there giving and entertain people and keep it interesting. Talking uh, second order Greeks, Greeks and distributions three times a week uh, can can not only um, you know, I enjoy it, but I, you know, can, can probably put, uh, hopefully everybody here is not asleep at this point, but can, can be a bit, uh, you know, um, mundane and, and, and repetitive. Um, so yeah, I, I try and keep it light and keep it interesting, but I also want people to, to do the work and to understand, because these aren't things that you can do and, and just earn, learn, you know, dive in a little bit and take a little bit and walk away. You're really best served by, by kind of understanding how the broad thing works, understanding the language um, and, and what these second order Greeks actually are and the effects that they have. Um, again, we, we've kept it light here in terms of Voma and Veda and, and Ivana and Charm, right? But the reality is those are, those are real effects that need to be understood. And, and, and uh, you know, we kind of have different symbols and things that represent the different ones, uh, different kind of uh, uh, things that, that help explain when the timing of things are the way they are. Um, you know, things along those lines, uh, you know, the other major flows like the Fed and the, 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 the way that that supply of, of dollars affects kind of volatility markets. We try and talk about all these things in kind of a light way. But if you dig underneath it, uh, don't be fooled by the cover. It's, it's, it's not a, a child's play. Um, it's, it's very informative, important stuff. Um, we, just, we just try to, to, to kind of speak in our own language. Fantastic. So yeah. uh, uh, I think, uh, Jim, this has been a, a gem of a conversation. You have charmed us. I'm sorry, that sounded very corny. But no, <laughs> I love it. it sounds Thank like something so I would say, so you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. We look forward to welcoming you to India the next time when you're here. Uh, you know, I'd love and, to. You know, you know, uh, obviously, you're going to enjoy the, your kids are going to enjoy their nanny's place as well. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's going to be fabulous. So Thank you so much. Really appreciate your taking out the time and helping us understand this and uh, look forward to further such uh, conversations much appreciated uh take care and i think I should my, my pleasure it. rajiv i um i'll definitely take you up on that next time i'm in mumbai cheers thank you so take much care.
Be well. Bye-bye.